Welcome everybody, and thank you for joining our Tips and Tricks webinar, Developing Portable Pipelines Using Whittle and Docker to Develop Locally and Scale to the Cloud. My name is Carolyn Claude, and I will be your moderator for today. I'd like to spend a few minutes covering some housekeeping items and uh, introduce today's speaker. This webinar will be recorded and sent out to all registrants via email after today's session, so you'll be able to go back and uh, review the content. You will see a Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in this Q&A box and we'll address all questions in the last 10 minutes of today's session. Your speaker for today is John Didion, Principal Scientist and Manager of Solution Architecture on the DNA Nexus Advantage team. John works with customers to design and implement solutions to complex informatics challenges on DNA Nexus. He has a broad background in the design and analysis of sequencing assays across the entire omics toolbox, including the use of clinical diagnostics, machine learning, and statistical genetics. John will give you an introduction to the DNA Nexus platform architecture, and then launch into an overview of building apps and workflows on DNA Nexus, do a deep dive on Docker. With that, I'll let John take it away. All right, thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for joining. This is John Didion. Um, also like to remember, remind everyone uh, that there is a part two to this webinar uh, that will be in two weeks, November 7th. Um, so today we're going to focus on the first aspect of developing portable pipelines, uh, which will focus on Docker. And then in the next for, uh, section of this webinar, we will cover uh, using the workflow development, or sorry, workflow description language to actually write our pipelines and launch them on DNA Nexus. So I'd like to begin by giving an overview of the DNA Nexus platform for those of you that uh, are not familiar. DNA Nexus is a cloud bioinformatics platform. Uh, it is built on top of cloud service providers like AWS and Microsoft Azure. And the goal of DNA Nexus is really to abstract a lot of the complexity of building and deploying solutions uh, for bioinformatics and other life science related applications uh, on the cloud, and also to provide strong security and uh, compliance for, um, for users that need that. Uh, so DNA Nexus has uh, FedRAMP authorization to operate, uh, and it's also HIPAA and ISO 2000, uh, 27001 uh, compliant as well. On top of these cloud platforms, DNA Nexus provides uh, computing and storage, um, and then we also provide an API, API to access um, the data and informatics. And then on top of this, um, we build solutions. So the XVantage team, of which I'm a member, works with uh, pharma, academia, and government clients to design and implement large and complex solutions on top of our cloud bioinformatics platform. DNA Nexus is a platform as a service. So you can think of um, the DNA Nexus platform as kind of a, uh, a white box providing access to storage and compute and other resources, um, as well as a security boundary, a strong security boundary. And then we provide an API uh, to access that platform in a variety of different ways. So you can access it from our web user interface at platform.dnanexus.com using our command line toolkit, which we call the DX toolkit, using various language bindings in Python, um, R, C++, and other languages or what we're gonna focus on today, which is using portable tools such as Whittle, CWL, and Docker to uh, build pipelines that will run on our platform as well. So if you're familiar with the DNA Nexus platform, you'll know that uh, for a very long time, we've had the ability to build what we call native uh, apps, applets running on our platform using our own um, custom developed uh, framework. So you write your uh, code in Bash or Python, which wraps a tool, for example, the BWA aligner. If you want to develop an application that runs BWA on DNA Nexus, you would wrap that tool with a Bash or Python script. 
uh, you would define a metadata file using our custom dxapp.json format. And then you would build your dependencies as what we call assets. Um, and these can include Docker images, or they can include things like uh, pre-installed packages using package managers like apt or pip um, or uh, code that's built from source. So this is all very uh, mature, but um, can be a little bit of a, a, a steep learning curve for new um, people coming onto the platform. Um, and then we have a separate from building applets, a separate process for designing workflows, which uh, primarily centers around our web user interface. I'm not going to go into these today because that's not the focus of our uh, webinar today, but we have a lot of documentation at our website, documentation.dnnexus.com, where you can go and learn about this way of doing things. More recently, we have developed mature support for using portable workflow languages, uh, WDL, which stands for Workflow Description Language, um, and also CWL, Common Workflow Language. Our WDL support is, is much more mature than CWL. Um, so we're gonna be focusing uh, in this webinar series on WDL. But both of these um, strategies rely on the use of Docker as the way that we get our tools and dependencies um, onto the platform. And so this is what we're gonna focus on today, just this first part of how do we build Docker images effectively for use within our portable workflows. Once we build our workflows in WDL or CWL, um, then we can compile them to native apps and workflows automatically using a tool that DNNXS provides called DXWiddle. And we'll see how to use that tool in the next, um, uh, the next session of this webinar series. So you might ask the question, you know, what's, what's the difference between these two ways of doing things, uh, natively building our apps and workflows versus using portable apps and workflows? And it really comes down to the velocity of development. So uh, when I'm developing natively, I first need to create, I'm sorry, my applications using that native uh, framework that I described. So I have to write all my code and metadata and then I have to build these onto the platform using our command line toolkit. And then I need to create a workflow that incorporates all of these applications. And finally, I need to test it on the platform. And if I find an error, then I need to go all the way back uh, and debug that, figure out where my error occurred, and then make changes to the applications to fix those bugs. So this turnaround time can be uh, uh, a little bit less than ideal. Uh, because the process of building onto the cloud and waiting for those jobs to start and complete uh, could take a little bit of time. So what we found is a much more um, agile way of developing workflows and applications is using portable workflow languages. And that looks something like this. So first I'm going to um, package up my tools and dependencies into Docker images. And if I want, I can test these independently. Uh, locally on my command line if I have the Docker client installed on my computer. I then create my tasks and workflows using a portable workflow language like Whittle. And then I can use local tools such as the Cromwell uh, uh, workflow runner developed by the Broad Institute to execute my workflow and find errors locally before I push it onto the cloud. And this cycle happens a lot faster. Um, this has become such a useful cycle that we have in fact developed a custom tool called PyTest Whittle in collaboration with one of our customers, Eli Lilly, to automate this testing cycle. And so we can even integrate our workflows into our continuous integration, continuous deployment cycle using this PyTest Whittle package. And we'll see a little bit about how to use this PyTest Whittle package again in the second um, episode of our webinar series. And it's not until I actually get to the point where my workflow um, is mature and, and uh, working successfully on my local machine that I actually push it into the cloud using this tool called DXWiddle. So again, we find that the major advantage of using portable workflows is to increase the, um, the velocity of development and decrease the turnaround time for each development cycle. 
Some other advantages of portable apps and workflows, um, it can take a lot of the uh, boilerplate out of writing applications. So if you're familiar with writing DNN access applications, you know that a lot of the code looks the same. You're downloading files from your project into the worker instance. Um, you're uploading results back to the project. Uh, if you're using Docker, then you maybe need to load and run the Docker image. So the majority of the, um, the boilerplate tasks are just taken care of for you automatically when you're using the, the portable workflow languages. Another cool uh, feature that we'll get into again in the, in the next version of this webinar is um, the ability to evaluate resource requirements dynamically. So what that means is, for example, if I don't know exactly how much disk space my application is going to need um, because it depends on the size of my input files, I can actually dynamically calculate how much disk space I need uh, at, at runtime for each um, instance of my workflow based on the input files and then always select the correct uh, instance to run. So this can save money by avoiding um, allocating an instance size that's too, too large and also avoids um, crashes due to out of memory or disk, uh, disk out of disk space. Um, portable workflows also have the benefit that I can execute them uh, anywhere, uh, locally in my HPC environment if I have one, and then of course on uh, DNA Nexus. And finally, it gives us the ability to share our workflows. Uh, there are websites such as DocStore where I can share uh, a workflow with the community, or I can put it on my GitHub account um, and share it that way. All right, so with that, uh, let's jump into the first part of our webinar, which is Docker. So today we'll talk uh, first about what is Docker. We're not assuming uh, much of any prior knowledge of these tools, so we're going to kind of level set at the beginning and describe what Docker is, and we'll talk about how we find we can find existing Docker images that people have already created, so we don't have to do the work ourselves if we don't want or need to. We'll talk about how to actually run a uh, code that's in a Docker image, um, and then finally we'll get into how to write our own Docker image and build it, build an image and push it to a registry or save it as a uh, snapshot that can be used on, uh, on DNA Nexus. All right, so what is Docker? Docker is a container format. Uh, and what that means is um, it's a single snapshot that encapsulates an operating system, executables, uh, dependencies, basically everything that's required all the way down to the operating system level to execute my uh, code. And some of the benefits of Docker are that uh, a Docker image is portable uh, and reusable and also reproducible. So um, the kind of the ideal of Docker is that you can write it once and run it anywhere and every time you run it, it's gonna run exactly the same. If I give it the same inputs, it should produce the same outputs. There's some caveats to that statement, but that's kind of generally, generally the idea. Um, and these images are also shareable. For example, one example of a, um, a place where I can find bioinformatics Docker images is this site called Biocontainers. So Biocontainers is a registry of bioinformatics uh, focused Docker images that people have published and shared, and I can search for tools that I would like. For example, the popular SAM tools uh, tool, I can search for that and see that somebody has already created and shared an image. Um, actually, there's multiple versions of the SAM tool image. And so if I wanted to, for example, grab SAM tools 1.9, I could just copy and paste this command to my command line, assuming I have the Docker client installed, and it would access this image. So this is a good way to find images that already exist um, and save the work of having to write your own. So let's just cover a couple of terminology points. Um, I use the terms image and container 
Um, and these actually mean two slightly different things. So a Docker image is a static snapshot of an environment. Um, you could save a Docker image as a file, um, typically a tar file. Whereas a Docker container is a, an instantiation of an image. So it's dynamic, it's running in memory. Um, you can make changes within a Docker container and it's ephemeral. If you don't do anything to capture those changes, then it goes away as soon as the container is, is exited. So we can think of the image as being kind of the, the source code and the container being different instances of, of that um, that I can uh, run with different parameters. So primarily going to be focusing on uh, Docker images today, how to, how to create them and how to um, put them in a form that they can be used on DNA Nexus. All right. So the first thing we want to do um, is see how we go and, and access an image that's already existing. And the example I'm going to use is the one that I just showed you, the SAMP tools image that is on uh, BioContainers Registry. And so I'm going to be working on the command line. Um, so you can feel free to follow along with me if you'd like. So the first command I'm going to run is docker pull. And what docker pull does is it looks uh, first on your local machine. So I'm running uh, a Docker client. And if you don't have this already, you can go to um, docker.com and, and get the version that's appropriate for your computer and install it. And essentially just, uh, this uh, makes it possible for you to run Docker images on your machine. And it includes a cache, a local uh, cache of images. So if an image exists somewhere out in the world on a registry, um, what you need to first do is pull it into your local cache and make it, uh, make it available for you to run locally. So that's what the Docker pull command does. This here is how we refer to a Docker image. Quay.io is the um, name of the registry website. If this part is missing, um, it's assumed to be dockerhub.com, so, or hub.docker.com. Um, so Docker, the company, operates a registry that is the, the default registry for Docker images. Um, and so that's the one you use by default. There are other ones like Quay. You could run your own Docker registry within your company or organization. So we're pulling a, uh, an uh, image from Quay, and then we have a repository name, and then the, the image name. Then we have this colon, which separates the image uh, ID from the, what's called the tag. So this goes to the um, reproducibility of using Docker. So each version of an image I build, I'm going to tag um, with some a uh, string that tells me about the version of the code that's being run there. So for example, this is tagging, um, this, this tag says that I'm running SAM tools version 1.9, and this is probably, for example, the GitHub um, com hash, uh, commit hash. So the user is, ba the, the person that created this image is basically trying to have a tag that kind of uniquely refers to the code that's packaged up in this Docker image. So if I run this command, um, it's going to uh, go and first look in my local repository to see my local cache to see if this image already exists, and it does. So it's not going to go and fetch it again. If you're running this for the first time and you've never used this image before, then you'll probably see a bunch of progress bars here as the download progresses. We can also see there's, there's a bunch of different components here. It's not just one, um, one single thing, but um, Docker is actually built on the um, concept of layers. So my Docker image is made up of several different layers. One might be the base operating system layer like uh, Debian or Ubuntu. 
Um, there may be other layers for different uh, you know, dependencies that are installed on top of those base layers. And this makes Docker images um, much more modular. So I don't always have to download you know, a, a gigabyte image every time I want to use uh, want to use an image. You know, I have two images using the same base image, then it's only ever going to download that base image once. And then every other time I have an image that relies on that base image, it's just going to use the cached version rather than downloading it again. I'll also see here that this image has a digest in the SHA using the SHA-256 algorithm. And what this is, is a unique one-way hash of the actual um, bits in the, contain in the image itself. And so this, this hash uniquely refers to a very specific um, version of this image. If I change one bit in that image, this digest would be different. And that brings us back to the point that um, Docker tags are not necessarily um, always referring to the same image, right? So I could publish a new version of this image, changing some things in it, and use the exact same tag, and it would overwrite the old version. And that can break reproducibility. So this is the first um, kind of tip and, and caveat is um, when we're referring to Docker images, especially in a production environment, we always want to refer to an image by its digest. And so the way we do that is using a slightly different version of uh, the docker pull command. So the first thing I'm going to do is define a digest um, of, an, of a version of this image that I want. And I'm going to define that as an environment variable. And I, I got this from the, um, the docker registry. So it's just a value I could copy and paste. So once I have this uh, digest set as an environment variable, I can refer to it using bash um, the bash notation. So this is now a variable in my shell. And then if I want to pull the specific Docker image version referred to by this digest, I use this slightly different um, format of the of the register or of the image uh, name. So instead of using a colon here, I'm using the at symbol to separate the image name from the digest. And then I have to tell it the digest uh, algorithm name, uh, which is in Docker world almost always SHA-256, and then colon, and then the digest itself. And so you can see that um, I, I also already had this one installed uh, locally or cached locally, but now my digest version is different. All right, so now I can use another Docker command, Docker images, to see which images I have installed. Um, I actually have a lot of them, so I'm going to filter this using graph. Let's look at SAM tools. So I have uh, um, these and one of which doesn't have any tag. Uh, but these are two different images, have two different hashes. Okay, so now I have pulled my image locally. So another thing to know about Docker is that it has a kind of special tag called latest. And what happens is if you create an image without giving it a specific tag, it will be created with the tag latest. Conversely, if you pull an image, without specifying a tag, Docker will automatically try to pull the, the image with the tag latest. Um, so this is another way that reproducibility can be broken because I can easily publish 
uh, you know, two very different versions of this image, and both of which get assigned the tag latest. So if I'm expecting to get the version that was latest as of six months ago, and then it's been updated since then, and I get a new version, it could potentially have different, you know, it could potentially be different parameters or, you know, all sorts of different things could be different, and that could break my tool because I'm depending on the wrong version of that image. So strongly recommend against relying on the latest tag, either when building or uh, consuming an image. So there are some other strategies you can use um, other than referring to the digest. For example, sometimes um, uh, people will tag their images using the, uh, the hash of the git commit. If they're committing their Docker images to a git repository such as GitHub, each of those commits has a separate uh, uh, unique hash. So you could use that hash uh, as a tag as well. All right, so we saw how to pull uh, an image using a digest. And the next thing we want to do is actually run our Docker image. So for, uh, for the rest of this webinar, I'm going to use the uh, version of the, the Docker commands that rely on using the digest. So Docker has uh, another subcommand called run, and the very uh, most very basic version of this command is simply to do docker run and then the, uh, the name of the image that I want to run. And what this is going to do is instantiate a container that's derived from this image and run some command in it. And um, by default, if, if nothing else is configured, it's just going to run the um, you know, kind of the shell that's that's set up uh, and the operating system that's contained within this container. And if I run this command without any other options, you can see that it just immediately executes. So it's, um, it's there's not really anything for it to do, so it kind of runs and then quits. So if I actually want to do something useful with this, I have to give it an entry point. And this is our SAM tools container so it makes sense that this container uh, um, has the SAM tools binary in it that I could run. And so what I'm going to do is add one parameter to this command, the entry point parameter. And that's going to say when you run this uh, container instead of running the shell, I want you to run this um, this tool which is uh, the SAM tools um, where the path at which it lives within this container. And so now can, we can see that it's uh, running SAM tools with no arguments. And by default, like most commands, if I run it without any arguments, it's just going to print some help documentation. So another way I might want to use my image is to run interactively. So actually start a shell um, that I can use to, uh, to, to run some commands or, or, or you know, do other things interactively. So to do that, sorry, I'm going to add the dash it option to my command. And dash i says run this image interactively, and then the T option says, as soon as I execute this container, destroy it, uh, because the default is to keep it around in memory, just kind of taking up space. So this is a very common um, pattern you'll see with uh, running Docker images. All right, and now you see it that I'm at a new sh uh, shell prompt, and then this prompt is actually quote unquote inside the Docker container. So if I do an ls, I'll, I'll find myself at the root of this container, and it kind of looks like the standard, you know, Linux uh, root directory. Um, so I could run SAM tools from here 
And because SAM tools is at user local bin, it's already in my system path. So I don't have to give a full path um, to run it. All right, so SAM tools is, is a very nice tool, but it does it's not very useful if I don't actually have some data to run on it. And my image was not created with any you know, BAM files or anything in it. So I need to get some data to it. Uh, so I could use a tool like wget to go and download some data from a website somewhere. But probably the most common usage of Docker is to um, use a local directory. So in my directory here, I have a bunch of data, um, just some test data in a folder called data. So I've got some a BAM file there that's just some alignments uh, uh, to chromosome 22. And I want to actually leverage this inside my container. So the way I do that is using a, another option to Docker run, which is the dash V option. And dash V stands for mount a volume. So the uh, format of dash V is um, that I'm giving at first the local directory that I want to mount, and then the target directory where I want to mount it inside my container. PWD is a command that just prints my current working directory. And this um, construct here means run this command and substitute the output of this command for this, uh, this expression. So it really just means I'm mounting my current local directory to the test directory slash test directory inside my container. All right, so now I'm in my container again. And if I do an ls um, slash test, you'll see now that all the same files that I had available on my local uh, machine are now available inside my Docker, uh, Docker container. And then I could do something like SAM tools view. Uh, the one drawback of doing things this way is I don't, um, by default, have tab completion available. So to copy and paste the file name. So I could just run a standard SAM tools view command on this. Oops. All right, so I have to make sure to refer to things by the path within the container. Again, mounted my local directory at slash test. And then when in that, I had the data folder and then this test chromosome 22 BAM file. And these are the first few reads in this BAM file. All right. So that's all in good, all well and good for uh, running commands interactively. Um, but the last piece of the puzzle is that when I run uh, workflows, I basically want it to be automated. So I don't want to run interactively. I want to run things without any manual intervention. So to do that, I can uh, use that same Docker run command, but get rid of the dash IT option again. So now I'm running interactively, or I'm sorry, now I'm running um, non-interactively. Again, I have to give an entry point, which is SAM tools. And then the way to run non-interactively is essentially to place all of the arguments to this entry point after the name of the image. So I'm saying to run SAM tools with view, um, and then the BAM file that I want to use. And again, I still have to refer to that BAM file that I want to use by its path within the container. Here I made a slight modification. So instead of mounting PWD, I actually mounted PWD slash data. So now my data file is just that slash test slash uh, test chromosome 22.bam.
And we can see that this gives um, essentially the same output as when I ran it interactively. Um, but now I could automate this. I could put this in a script or uh, execute this as part of a whittled task. So it's important to remember that um, uh, how standard out uh, works when you're using Docker. So when I run a Docker command like this, um, uh, by default, SAM tools view writes its output to standard out. And that standard out is going to actually be forwarded, um, quote unquote, outside of the container. So if I use a pipe command here, uh, I'm actually piping that SAM that that uh, uh, that SAM tools output to something on my local uh, shell. So I just piped it to the more command, but I could also redirect it to a file. You know, so I could redirect it to local output dot SAM. And this is going to be a file on my local local machine, not within the container. On the other hand, if I wanted to use the dash O option of SAM tools, uh, let me wrap this around so it's a little bit easier to read. So let's say I wanted to write, uh, have SAM tools write the file directly rather than to standard out. Now I would have to give it a path within the container. So I could say test slash um, container output dot SAM. All right, and now that's going to be here. So just, uh, just a, it takes a little bit of getting used to um, thinking about things running at, at two different levels, uh, locally versus within a container. And uh, you know, where file output is going to be going depending on how you call the command. Fortunately, when we are writing our Whittle tasks, we don't really have to worry about any of this. Um, uh, the Whittle engine, uh, like Cromwell, takes care of all of this for us. We just have to give it our Docker image and a little uh, script telling it the, the commands that we want to run. Uh, but this is useful for testing locally. If you want to test your Docker image before you actually build your, uh, build your Whittle um, workflow. And it can also be useful to have access to these tools uh, running in Docker rather than having to go through the hassle of installing them all yourself um, on your local computer. All right, so now we've seen how to access a, a Docker image and run it. The next thing you might be wondering is how do I actually create my own Docker image if I have a tool that I can't find anywhere else on the, on the internet as, as having been Dockerized. So we'll walk through the process. It's relatively straightforward. Um, this is kind of a general recipe for creating a Docker image. There's going to always be you know, details that are different for each tool. And every tool should hopefully come with a readme file that tells how to install it so that you can customize this. Um, but essentially what we're going to do is create uh, a file called a Docker file. And by default, the name of this file should be literally Docker file, uh, typically with an uppercase D. So that's the file name by default that Docker is expecting to find. You can use other file names. You just have to use an option to the Docker build command to tell it uh, what the what the file name is. So in our Docker file, there's going to be um, a series of instructions. There's a few common instructions that we use. The first one is the from instruction. So from tells Docker to use a specific 
base image. So if you think of all the different Linux distributions that exist, like Ubuntu and Debian, um, others such as Alpine, these um, all ha will have different base images that are uh, available in Docker Hub that you can choose from to use as your base image. Uh, I tend to like using the Debian base images because they, uh, especially the slim versions of those images, because they provide a good balance between features and size. Um, Stretch was the, the, the previous version, uh, Busters as a relatively new version within the past six months. So either of those are good base image to work with. And there are also um, specialized versions of these base images. For example, if you are using Python, there is a Python 3.7 version of Stretch Slim that you could use as your base image. So you don't have to install uh, Python from scratch. So after you specify your base image, um, next you have to get the source code for the tool that you want to install into your image. Um, so you could use that using a command like wget. Um, you know, typically you're downloading a tar file from a website, you know, GitHub or SourceForge or the tools um, own, you know, um, own website. Uh, but there is a, a specific instruction that we'll we can use called add to automatically do that download uh, of the file for us and download it into the, um, the build context. Another command we'll see is the arg command. Um, so uh, one way I can define the um, tool that I want to install is to specify an exact uh, version number in my Docker file. Uh, for example, BWA version 0 0.7.17. But then every time I want to upgrade the BWA version in my Docker image, I have to, ch I have to edit that file uh, and change the code. A nicer way to do things is to actually parameterize things like version numbers using the R instruction. And then I can pass in at build time the version number that I want to use. Um, so then I only need to run a new Docker command. I don't actually have to touch the source of my Docker file. The last command we'll be looking at is run, which um, is essentially just running uh, commands in a Linux uh, shell. So run is what we're going to use to install dependencies. For example, I'll be using Debian, which uses the apt package manager. So we'll run some apt commands to install uh, the build time dependencies like uh, make and GCC. And then we'll be running commands to do things like untar the tarball um, that uh, contains the BWA source and run make, and then finally um, install the compiled binary into a location that's accessible on the path, typically user local bin. All right, so let's actually see an actual example of a, a Docker file. So this is a Docker file specifically for BWA. Um, it's highly encouraged to do things like use comments. Your comment will start with the pound sign or hash sign to uh, describe what your image um, does and contains. Um, as I mentioned, the first instruction is going to be that from instruction. And here I'm saying use Debian uh, stretch slim as your base image. I can also add some metadata um, using the label instruction. And these are free form key value pairs. So if your uh, organization has some different um, as you, know, you can essentially create an ontology of metadata to describe your tools that you, you create to make them easy to search and, and index. Here's that, that arg command I mentioned. So I'm creating a, an argument called BWA version. And this, this, uh, this is creating a variable within my Docker file that I can reference, for example, here. I reference it using the, uh, the familiar kind of dollar sign and curly brace uh, bash syntax. And this, this is a variable that I will define when I call the, the docker build command. So I'll pass in the value for it at build time. The add command goes and fetches this file. 
This is the source file for BWA. And it copies it locally to a location within my, um, my image, temp apps. And then I'm just giving it a generic name here, bwa.tar.gz. And finally, my run command does kind of the familiar things we do when we're building source code. So I'm first updating my apps package manager because the packages may have changed since this, um, since this uh, image was, the space image was built. And I'm gonna install my build time dependencies like GCC and make. Uh, BWA also depends on uh, Zlib, which is the gzip library. I'm gonna go to this location where I downloaded um, BWA, so CD to temp apps, make a new directory for BWA and unpack the tarball. I use a couple of options here to tar um, to make it easier to deal with the fact that I don't know at run at, uh, you know, when I'm writing this, what the exact BWA version is gonna be. So I tell it use dash C to tell it to unpack the tarball into this BWA subdirectory I've created. And I use strip components to tell it to ignore the first directory path within the tarball. A lot of times when um, source tarballs of these tools like BWA are created, they, uh, inside the tarball will be a directory which has the actual name of the BWA version. And again, since I don't necessarily know what that is when I'm writing this, I want to just ignore that directory. And, and so, basically saying move, uh, unpack all the contents of whatever the, the first level directory is within my tarball into the BWA subdirectory. And then I'm gonna go ahead and make it. Um, BWA doesn't actually have a make install command, so I have to, to actually move the binary into user local bin. And then I'm gonna do some cleanup. So just remove this temp apps uh, subdirectory that I created. Um, I should say that all of the um, test data and source code for these webinars uh, can be made available on a project on DNA Nexus. So just uh, reach out and, and request that to, um, to where you signed up for this webinar. And we can, uh, if you have a DNA Nexus account, we can add you as a user on this project so you can grab all of these example files and play with them yourself. All right, so now that I have created this Docker file, what I actually wanna do is build, build it into an image. All right, so I'm working in this BWA subfolder. My only file here is, is a Docker file that I created. And the first thing I have to do, we remember we put an argument there um, define, uh, to define the BWA version. Um, so I have to define that at build time. So I'm gonna set an environment variable, BWA ver, and the version I wanna install is 0 0.7.17. And then I'm gonna do my Docker build command. And a nice way to do it is to actually tag your uh, image with the BWA version that, um, that is inside the image, right? So I'm gonna use this environment variable and substitute it in here as both the tag name and as the value to my argument. And the way I pass that argument is with this dash dash build dash arg. Uh, option to Docker build. And the last thing I have to give Docker build is a directory where it's actually going to do the building and I'm just giving it the current directory which I did the, the dot um, character is a shortcut for that. So if you do this it's going to go through a bunch of um, steps and finally generate the Docker image.
All right, so just a few best practices, a couple of which I've already mentioned. So document your image using labels or comments. Um, it's best to kind of follow the Unix model of tool development and, and make each tool or each image do one specific task. So install one package per image, including any dependencies it needs. Um, there is a concept called multi-stage builds, uh, which I think that I'm going to cover in the next version of this webinar since we're running a little short on time today. Uh, uh, but you know, kind of follow some good housekeeping rules that don't install any unnecessary dependencies. Um, the run, copy, and add instructions actually each create new, a new layer every time you run them. Um, so you can minimize the number of layers by writing as few run, copy, or add instruction, uh, instructions as possible. Um, and kind of standard oops, bash practice used the backslash command to wrap long lines so that you can read a, you know, read a whole command on a single screen without having to scroll left or right um, and use the uh, double ampersand to chain together multiple commands. So you remember my run command, I actually only have one run command and I just do everything as a one long chain of commands separated by double ampersand. Finally, we recommend not defining um, command or entry point. These are two other instructions that can define default entry points for your container, but um, it can cause reproducibility issues to rely on these things. So we recommend not even thinking about entry points at all when you're writing a Docker file and just always um, be explicit about what your entry point is when you're running your Docker, uh, Docker image. All right, as I mentioned, I'm going to cover multi-stage builds in the next webinar, as well as how to use Docker images on DNA Nexus. So with that, um, I'll wrap up for today. Again, remember that this is a two-part webinar. Please come back on November 7th for the second half, where we'll finish up these last few items in Docker and then get into Whittle and writing reproducible Whittle workflows on DNA Nexus. So at this point, I will be happy to answer any questions from the audience. And uh, again, thank you for attending and for your attention. Great. Thank you, John. Um, as a reminder, if anyone has any questions, please uh, type them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, OK, so first question, um, is there any negative impact on performance using Docker versus natively compiled software? Uh, that's a great question. So um, typically. There is not a huge um, negative overhead of using Docker. Um, there can be some negative impact in the network I.O., but since DNX, uh, DNX applications are typically not using network I.O. Um, you know, to go and fetch things from remote web servers or anything like that, it's, it's usually not a problem. So I would say that the overhead of using Docker is, is minimal. All right, great. And then another question, um, this is from uh, kind of in the middle of your uh, presentation, but can we uh, use wget to get the Docker image from biocontainers directly instead of Docker pull alternatively? Uh, no, so um, you would, if you want to use wget, it would have to be a, uh, a snapshot of the Docker image. Um, so in, in the next uh, uh, part of the webinar, we'll look at how we actually create snapshots using the docker save command. So if I docker save an image, I could take the tar file that is generated by that process and put it on a web server somewhere. And then I could use wget to fetch that. And in fact, that's one good way of using docker images on DNA Nexus is to create a snapshot using docker save and then putting them on a project in your DNA Nexus account. And that removes any reliance that you have on an external uh, web server like Docker Hub, which you know, if Docker Hub goes down and you're trying to pull a uh, an image from Docker Hub, then your app is going to fail. And if you want to insulate yourself against those kind of um, external dependencies, then again, putting uh, putting the Docker image as a snapshot within your DNX account is the best way to uh, to avoid that.
All right, and then um, last question, unless there are any that come in in the final minute. Uh, what's the meaning of stretch slim versus buster slim deviant? Mm. Um, so these are just two different distributions of the Debian um, Linux uh, operating system. So every approximately two years, Debian will come out with a new major version. And they usually give these you know, cutesy names like Stretch or Buster. I think all the names from Debian are from Toy Story. So just uh, these are just um, two different versions. Uh, Buster is newer than Stretch. Stretch is about two years old. Buster is only about six years, six months old. Okay. Very great. Um, is there a default location to which containers are saved? Uh, an error pops up that says unable to find image locally. Mm. Yeah, so that image, that error is due to the fact that um, whoever made the SAM tools image didn't uh, provide a, a latest tag. So there's no version of that image with the latest tag, which is actually I, you know, a good practice. I, I want to reiterate. So um, to, to make that command work, you would actually have to use a specific uh, version, a specific tag to pull the SAM tools image. Um, latest will not work. All right, well, that brings us uh, to almost about time. Um, with all the questions that we have for today, uh, John, thank you again for uh, taking the time to run through that demo. And then just a reminder for everyone to sign up for the second session on November 7th. You can find the links to register at dnanexus.com slash expantage group. And then uh, look out for the recording of this webinar in your inboxes. Thank you all.